I'm uh, just returning to a theme that crops up a lot in my videos, and it um, sort of resurfaced again in terms of desire uh, that's being discussed, and uh, desire and how it actually works, I suppose, from the first-person perspective. Now, I'm not arguing again for the existence of an I. I'm just um, pointing out that perception, whatever it is that's perceiving things, um, is a difficult thing to illustrate, and you can only do so, in my opinion, metaphorically. But I would say that the perception of the passage of time is central to our perception. Whether or not time is actually passing is another argument, but the perception, or perhaps even as some would say, the creation of the perception of the passage of time is um, apparently central to perception itself. Now, what I am showing here is um, the usual illustration of somebody in a forward-moving car, they're sitting in the back seat looking out the rear window. And as you can imagine from that point of view, things appear at the peripheries. Things appear left and right and move towards the center of the picture or below and above, and they move towards the center of the picture. Anybody who's taken perspective in, in the most basic of art courses um, you know, can sort of easily see what I'm referring to here. The vanishing point in this case is where the sky meets the street, um, but it's interesting I chose this part or this picture deliberately from New York City because it's got a sun there and you know for the purposes of um, metaphor it's kind of neat to have a sun there because it sort of says that something quite profound is taking place at the end of all of this where things vanish or as one might illustrate as they appear. Now the normal perception of time the normal perception of time of people who believe that humans are simply as it were, passive observers or passive subjects, or sorry, objects of um, reality. Uh, and, and I would say a hard term deterministic view of reality is what we're seeing right now. Things appear at the periphery and they move towards the center and vanish. That which is on the margins, either top, bottom, left, right, is the very recent past, perhaps in the last couple of seconds. And as you move towards the vanishing point, towards the lower center of the picture, things recede into the distance to the point where at the vanishing point you've forgotten them altogether. So, for example, something at the peripheries, say on the extreme left-hand side of the photograph, is an event, say the large building with several stories that ends at, say, where it says Radio City there, that's a major event that is, that is still ongoing in our lives, so let's say a new job, but we've gotten it fairly recently because the building ends not that far in terms of our entire perception of things from the vanishing point, the vanishing point being where we don't remember anything anymore. Everything is now out of our memory, or at least consciously. After the Radio City sign, that building is no longer sort of part of a thing that is a coherent memory um, because it only entered our perceptions at that point. So we don't see that building beyond the Radio City um, sign. All we see is other things that have stopped happening in our past that we now remember. And you'll notice that they get smaller as they recede towards the vanishing point. And what that essentially illustrates is the fact that your memories become smaller, and I would say less accurate, as they move towards the vanishing point. Not that memory can always be 100% accurate, but... The thing is, um, <clears throat> this is essentially a view of time as seen or perceived by a completely passive observer. Um, it's not to say that a passive observer is not putting value on these things as they recede towards the vanishing point. I might particularly like one building here and not like another one. <clears throat> it doesn't mean that, um, that I'm not actually reacting to these things and putting value on them. All I'm saying is their actual appearance in my, um, in my, as Pyro would call it, my information stream is not something I am in control of. It is something that is happening to me. That's, in my opinion, and <clears throat> it's not, this isn't my metaphor, I keep saying. <clears throat> it's a metaphor I came uh, by a long time ago, but it stayed with me. Now, this is portrayed as the normal way that people see time, the conventional view of time. <clears throat> uh, 
Time is all things that you can actually describe. In other words, they've all happened. Now, this isn't to say that there are no other ways to see time, or to see perception, or to see perception of time, or whatever, perception of reality. <clears throat> As I always say, imagine turning around, looking over the driver's shoulder in this scenario, through the windshield. What do you see? Now remember, things are no longer appearing at the periphery, they're appearing at dead center here. Um, because in, in the previous case, the vanishing point was where things sort of stop existing, i.e. you forget about them completely. But in the other case, if you turn around and see the street this way with the sun right in your eyes, now let's just imagine that we're looking forward into the street instead of back. Things are not appearing at the periphery, they're appearing at the vanishing point. And in this case, because of the sun, it's very hard to look directly into this, because there, there's so much information coming at you all at once, um, simultaneously, that it can sort of blast your head out. Or, you know, just metaphorically speaking, it's just too overwhelming to actually see, because, again, you're looking directly into the face of becoming. You're looking directly into... Um, the face of existence, or whatever you want to call that which is happening now. Whatever now means. Now, that's a hard concept to, to uh, pin down as well. What I'm talking about is seeing things in a completely, almost the opposite way of the normal passage of time, the normal sequence of events, the normal... Um, dare I use this metaphor, through the normal doors of perception. Um, <clears throat> if you are looking into the face of becoming, um, you don't have any memories to help you make sense of it. So that is if, if the face of becoming is all you see. If you see the face of becoming without the assistance of memories to help you make sense of it, then you get, again, what Petr Vessel Solpfe described in The Last Messiah as blasted by reality. And you've, you've, you're, not only are you blasted by reality, but you're blasted by reality without any props, as it were, to help you deal with it. All your memories are erased, or at least in terms of your perceptions in the moment, and all you have is what is actually taking place, whatever that is. <clears throat> reality completely unfiltered hitting you in the face like a fire hose now again um, Zapfi implies that if you actually do perceive things that way unprepared uh, it could kill you and this again is implied in a lot of other traditions it's implied in Plato's metaphor of the cave where um, it's implied that if you yanked one of the prisoners up out of the cave and threw him out into the broad daylight he may go insane he may die uh, it's also implied in the Bhagavad Gita, where um, Krishna, God, shows Arjuna, our everyman, uh, reality completely unaided uh, by all the sort of forms that we project onto reality. That's my explanation of it. I understand that it's pretty un ina inadequate, and a lot of people might be completely mystified by this, and I, I don't you know, blame anybody. Most people don't even bother to think about stuff like this, in my experience. But what I'm asking is, <clears throat> I've had this metaphor critiqued, and some people have said that well, what it, the, there's a flaw in all of this, and that perceives that that, and that's the presupposition that there's an I here perceiving all of this. I say I understand why somebody might say that, but let's just say that there's no I as such, but there is simply that which is perceiving that which is perceived. In other words, uh, as they say in a number of the Upanishads in uh, Indian philosophical thought. What is it that actually sees that which is seen? What is it that actually hears that which is is heard? Um, or since we, since suffering is central to all of this, as it was in the case of the Buddhists, what is it that is actually suffering? That is what that that is the whatever it is is what I refer to as the entity that is perceiving all of this. So I'm not positing an I, and I am not positing free will. I can't say this enough. All I'm positing is a different perspective 
on reality itself. Instead of the conventional one where events start at the periphery and move towards the center, how about one where things start at the center and move towards the periphery? First of all, what would be involved in switching perspectives? Well, I would say, first of all, would be curiosity. You would have to want to know if what you were seeing was the only possible way to see things. You would no longer be a passive object of what was happening. You would no longer simply be on the receiving end of a bunch of information. You want to look directly at the source of the information. And the source of the information is invisible when you're looking through the rear window when the car is moving forward. The source is kind of at the absolute limit of your abilities to perceive anything. Remember, you're staring actually at the vanishing point in this picture. And what is beyond the margins or beyond the periphery of this picture is kind of outside of your ability to see because things only come at you within this stream of things. <clears throat> so to even actually imagine that there is an alternate way of looking at things amounts to desire. It amounts to a speculation on a couple of questions, perhaps an infinite number, but I, you know, generally I see it as sort of two questions. What am I and what is the universe? These two questions have to arise in order for you to see um, reality any differently from this uh, version, looking backwards through a forward moving car. Um, you have to sort of say, I want to switch perspectives. Once you've done that, you've introduced desire into the causal chain. It operates in a fundamentally different way than normal perception. Normal perception has things coming at us, as it were, beyond our control, and we can place, I guess we can place value on that which has already happened. But desire looks out into that which has yet to happen, which may happen, which may not happen, which, you know, is pure becoming, the pure now, not even the future, but the pure now, whatever you, however you want to define the now. Not only is desire involved in switching perspectives, but to maintain that perspective, you have to maintain desire. I'm just putting this out there as sort of a recapitulation of my previous um, number of videos on this, because it's come up again, and I'm discussing it with Pyro, and I'm really interested, and I'd like to see what he might say, what objections he may have to this illustration of a first-person driver's seat perspective in the information stream, and if it sort of meshes with his own, or how he might object to it how we might correct it or whatever. Uh, I think that we have a couple of disagreements because he sees desire, if I understand him, as something that appears at the periphery and moves towards a vanishing point like anything else. I tend to see desire as something that comes from that which is the observer of all of this. I'm not saying that desire, that individual desires don't appear when we when things appear at the periphery and desires are triggered by this, I'm saying the overall phenomenon of desire as it, um, as it pertains to this particular metaphor. A lot of people are sort of having trouble with uh, my use of individual desires versus desire itself. How about we forget about the individual desires in this photograph and look at simply the projection of any and all desires onto it? and onto its alternative model, which is to look the other way, as it were, look backwards. If the eyes could see back into themselves, what would they see, type thing. Uh, just a, sort of, again, a recap. It's nothing terribly original in this, but I was hoping to sort of trigger some sort of discussion uh, on the merits of this particular metaphor.